Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome all of you uh, to the National Air and Space Museum. My name is Jennifer Lavasser, and this is our astronaut program today. It is my honor and pleasure to get to introduce astronaut Kevin Ford, who's here to talk to us about his experience in space. Kevin is a retired U.S. Air Force colonel, and he joined NASA in 2000. He flew, uh, was the pilot of space shuttle flight STS-128, which uh, ha occurred in 2009, happened to be uh, the pilot of our own discovery out at the Udvar Hazy Center. He also flew to the International Space Station in October of 2012 and was commander of the space station from November through March of 2013. So he's only been back on Earth for just a few months. Uh, Colonel Ford has over 4,000 hours of flying experience and 157 days in space. He's a native of Indiana and comes uh, from the University of Notre Dame with a Bachelor of Science degree. He has Master of Science degrees from Troy State University and the University of Florida, and has a PhD from the Air Force Institute of Technology. Welcome all, to all of you, and let's welcome Colonel Kevin Ford. All right. Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, thank you for not saying anything uh, negative about Notre Dame. I know you're a Michigan grad, and uh, that took some restraint, I know. I appreciate the introduction. It's great to be here in our nation's uh, Air and Space Museum, and uh, my, my uh, spaceship discovery is now uh, here at the space, uh, the space Museum as well, and I, I haven't had a chance to see it myself yet, but I can't wait to get over and see that. Uh, I did have a, a, the great opportunity and good fortune of flying Space Shuttle Discovery to the International Space Station in late 2009, <clears throat> and then having the opportunity to return again on a Soyuz spacecraft, a Russian Soyuz, to spend uh, five, almost five months on the space station just, uh, just late last fall uh, through the spring. So I did just return just a of, uh, two months ago. And let's see, and out here a little bit. Just go, the mic, I think it's cutting out a little bit. Uh, and uh, had, a, had a great, living aboard is very different than, uh, than visiting on a space shuttle mission. Should I just turn this off? Okay, I think I'm going to go to the handheld mic since it was cutting out just a little bit there for uh, our audience outside the building. Uh, the, the living in space is a completely different thing than visiting on a space shuttle sortie. Uh, the, short, the, the shuttle sortie of about uh, two weeks is very uh, choreographed, orchestrated, planned ahead of time. Checklists are written out and we do everything, deliver the cargo, we get in and we get out of there and we try not to disturb the resident crew. And being there as a resident crew, doing science, living on board, and spending months and months there is a very different experience. So uh, I'm going to share today with you uh, the information more about the expedition. But at the end of the session, in about a half an hour, we're going to take some questions. And if anybody has any questions about Discovery itself or the Soyuz operations and how they're similar and different, uh, please feel free to ask. If we could go to the first slide, um, I flew up on, uh, on Soyuz uh, called Soyuz 32S because it was the 32nd Soyuz to visit the International Space Station in the program history. Soyuz have, have flown many, many uh, hundreds and hundreds of sorties safely, but this was the 32nd one to the, the space station, the International Space Station. They also flew to Mir and uh, before that to Salyut and so forth. So um, there's, a, there's our International Space Station on the screen and also uh, the rocket that I flew up on. That rocket, the Soyuz rocket, is about the size of a space shuttle solid rocket booster. So quite a bit smaller than the space shuttle is itself. Its sole purpose is just to carry the three people up there, deliver them, and then serve as a lifeboat while you're on board the space station and come home again. There's a beautiful model in this, uh, in this uh, area right here that uh, you can have a look at before you leave too. I'm going to spend some time admiring it. It's, uh, it really uh, gives you a nice feel of the three-dimensional nature of the space station. If you'll give me the next slide, I put this, uh, this photo in to show you. It was taken at the end of STS-132 as the space shuttle was departing, and it's almost completely in its glory there. You can see a Soyuz docked to the top port there with those little bitty solar rays up in the middle, and that is where, when I arrived uh, back in October, we parked our Soyuz on a module called POISC, which means... Uh, search, kind of is in search for knowledge. That's where we parked, and we left our Soyuz there for the, uh, for the five months we were on board. Next slide, please. 
This just gives you a feel for the size. It's really hard for people to imagine how big the International Space Station is. I can tell you when you see it out the windows as you're approaching, it looks absolutely huge. There's a football field underneath it uh, where the NASA football team plays. And uh, you can see how, how big and how much acreage it covers. The interior volume is about the interior of a, what would be a 747 aircraft if you emptied out. This gives us a lot of room to live and to do science and maintenance and stow things that you might need during the course of the expedition. Next slide, please. Uh, we leave now uh, to and from the space station at the current time on a Soyuz uh, rocket that uh, again just carries three crew members. The spacecraft itself is tiny and fits underneath the nose of the fairing on the front of the rocket and that rocket booster <clears throat> takes us to space in about nine minutes and uh, this is what it looks like in Kazakhstan. You can see we don't have quite the crowd in Kazakhstan that we would have in Florida. Next slide. There's uh, after you uh, get into space and the rocket has done its job and delivered you there, the solar arrays pop out, and you'll see uh, you'll get to see a little uh, video in the in the uh, movie I'm going to show in a second, where you can see those uh, arrays extending. And this is what the spacecraft looks like. That spacecraft is actually made up of that bulb on the front. That's the habitation module. If you can see that, um, that's not accessible during launch. Um, it's closed off, and that's where we live uh, during the two-day transit to the International Space Station because it takes us, as a routine, about 50 hours to get there. The middle section of that piece right there looks like a little gumdrop shape, and that is the uh, descent module, and that's the piece that we end up coming all the way to the ground in. That's the only part of the spacecraft that survives re-entry all the way to the ground, and it's got the parachutes in it, it's got a main and a spare, and that's how uh, we get home safely. And then the bottom section is the electrical. You can see the arrays and the solar, uh, well, the, the solar arrays and the propulsion system on the back and lots of antennas. And this is where the main engine is uh, as well that allows us to increase our altitude and do our rendezvous with the space station. And then when it's time to come home, to fly away from the space station safely and then do our slow down burn. We have to burn uh, an engine for about f almost five minutes now from the 250 miles of altitude. And that slowing down is what allows us to fall back to the Earth and out of orbit. We now, if, once we've slowed down, we don't have the speed to stay in orbit anymore. We fall back, we catch the atmosphere, and we essentially uh, re-enter just like a meteor would. So uh, that's the way we come home, and then a parachute to a hard landing on the ground in uh, Kazakhstan. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a really cool space shot of my buddies that joined me in the middle of the, um, the expedition and my time on board coming in, the moon in the background and the Soyuz pointing at us in the blackest space. It's really, um, it's really an uh, amazing set of machines, but when you get into space and you look at the beauty of it, it seems uh, so simple against the blackness of, uh, of the cosmos. Next slide. Uh, these are the crews. I was there as part of Expedition 33 and then Expedition 34. So you usually split your time. You're a three-person crew that goes up, and you join a three-person crew that's already been there. So they're the senior crew, if you will, and then we're the junior crew for a while. They teach us all about the space station, get us all set up, hand it over, and then they leave, and a new crew comes up. So that's my first uh, six-person six expedition in the top left, and the final compliment we had on board on the bottom right. Three members of the crew on the bottom right picture there are... Uh, in the dark blue seats, uh, Romanenko, Hadfield, Marshburn just landed last night in Kazakhstan and are on their way back to their homes as we speak. I know Hadfield and Marshburn are in an airplane somewhere over the Atlantic headed to Houston at this very second. Next slide. Um, this is the last slide I'm going to show before I start a little bit of a crew movie. And I wanted to show you this one because in the movie you're going to see these two guys flying. These two little bowling ball sized satellites are called spheres. It's just one of the uh, engineering test bed things that we do on Space Station, if you will. And these, two, these satellites can fly around. They have their own propulsion system and their own brains. And I wanted to show you this because the, in the movie you can't tell it very well, but the one on the left there, the red guy, actually has his own brains and his own eyes. You can see the, the lens caps there on the glasses. And he can find the blue satellite, fly over to it, fly in, look at it from a certain angle, which is all very useful someday in space. If you want to send your robot out to go look for an ammonia leak, you could just put it out the hatch. It could go out, go find the leak, take pictures of it, and send it back inside to you. We wouldn't have to go out and do a spacewalk and invest all those resources, few, few, three or four days of resources, to go find problems like that. So if you could now, we'll take it uh, to, the, to, to the movie. And I'll be uh, just narrating most of the movie. There is some sound uh, as well, so I'll, 
I'll uh, quiet down a little bit when there's something to be heard. So these are clips, uh, really, both of uh, Expedition 33 and 34. Again, we launched uh, on the 23rd of October out of Kazakhstan. And uh, on, the, uh, on the days prior to, the, to arriving in Kazakhstan, they roll the rocket out. They take it out of its hangar uh, on a train track. And early morning, uh, the prime crew doesn't ever get to see the rocket before launch, but the backup crew gets to go see. You can see it's got strap-on boosters on the back and a middle section. It's got kerosene and liquid oxygen as propellant. And then the spacecraft is underneath the white section on the front, which you'll see in just a minute. It never hurts to get a little blessing before you go fly in space. Uh, we are very happy to get that. Nobody ever turns that down as far as I know. We'll take all the luck we can get and all the help we can get. So uh, walk out to the bus. Usually some of the family members get to come and join us and, uh, and see us off uh, real briefly. We are quarantined, so it's very carefully controlled. Those are doctors walking behind us to make sure we don't touch any of the wrong people. We're allowed to touch the big shots, but we're not allowed to touch any of the wrong people. So we get suited up. Um, we do wear pressure suits on uh, ascent and entry as well. And uh, you climb in through that opening right there, and then they tie it up with rubber bands twice. They fold it over, and they stick it in, and you zip it up tight. And it actually holds pressure just fine. So we do, uh, we do get the suits put on by professionals. We do everything way too early, so there's a lot of sitting around and waiting uh, a lot of times before launch time. This is a chance to get in. The specialists make sure the suit is germatichin. It's uh, actually airtight, and it can hold pressure. And we make sure that if, for some reason, on ascent, the spacecraft depressurizes because of some kind of problem, or we have to re-enter immediately, and we have some kind of depressurization, uh, then we will be safe inside these suits, all pressured up. It is like being inside a really, really tight beach ball, though. It doesn't give you much mobility. It's a little tight and uncomfortable to work in, but it's better than the alternative uh, if you were to depressurize to vacuum. So uh, all the formalities, a lot of NASA management came to join us and see us off, which is uh, very heartwarming to see a lot of your friends uh, there all the way in Kazakhstan. Much appreciated. The chief of Roscosmos here saying uh, final goodbyes and uh, telling us not to mess up. Up the ladder we go. We get into a very small elevator and crawl up and then spend about, oh, 45 minutes getting into our seats. Uh, the first time you ever actually make the entry into the spacecraft and take your perch inside the Soyuz is uh, launch day. Uh, you get in there once one other time, but not in the same way you do this day. So uh, here's a little launch sequence. I'll just kind of let the video or the audio play on, on this one. Lift off. Lift off of Kevin Ford, Evgeny Tarokin and Oleg Novitsky as they head on a two-day trip to the International Space Station. A little bit of high clouds, but uh, didn't really get in our way. As we punch up through, the rocket launch is just a big push in the back, lots of vibration, lots of stirring left and right and up and down as the rocket steers itself. And then big booms and bangs, as like you can see the strap-on boosters coming up, off right here. They last about two minutes, then they separate and fly off. And every time one of these pyrotechnic events happens, there's a big bang inside, and you kind of, okay, that was supposed to be there, right? Yeah, that was supposed to be there, and then you're happy. We have, uh, usually have a little toy hanging inside so that we can see when we're in zero G and kind of what the G level is. You can see that thing swinging at kind of a high frequency. doesn't quite look normal like it would swing if you had it hanging at home, and that's because in the, under the high Gs, it swings in a little bit of a stiffer fashion. Um, we've, uh, at this point, just shut down the engines. Uh, this thing's happened fast here. If you look in the window in the top, uh, top of the screen, you can see the solar array through the glass there that's deployed. It's all deployed automatically. And after we get off the rocket, we're kicked off again with like a pyro explosion. And then for the next orbit, we just tumble. We just tumble outside, and you can see our toy is, uh, is telling us it's floating. And if we weren't strapped in our seats, we'd be doing the same thing. But we stay strapped in nice and tight for quite a while. Because after we get off, we fire up all the spacecraft systems and turn on the jets, and we do some maneuvering, and we do some burns. We actually call them burns when we light our rocket engine and add some altitude to our orbit at just the right times so that two days uh, further down the line, we'll be in a position to fly up to the International Space Station and rendezvous with it. So this is Oleg, my Soyuz commander, and Yevgeny. There's out my window, a little bit of jets firing and so forth. And this is uh, taken uh, uh, out, out my, my right window. That's the Nile River Valley right there uh, during our orbits during the first couple days. Really spectacular uh, to be up there. 
The two cosmonauts I flew with uh, were both first-time Soyuz flyers. I don't call them rookies because they're super experienced, but they, uh, they are first-time flyers. And of course, it was my, my first time in a Soyuz as well. So this is a new experience to most of us. That little spin right there on that toy, that's a toy Soyuz inside, a real Soyuz. And that's the kind of spin we do for a couple days as we're waiting to catch up and phase up to the International Space Station. We do that to stabilize our attitude so that we can keep our solar rays pointed at the sun. And this is what it looks like uh, out the window as we, as we make this uh, solar spin. It's about two and a half degrees per second, and it just keeps us in a nice inertial orientation with the sun always perpendicular to our solar rays. So um, we rendezvous uh, again after 50 hours, so it's, uh, it's an amazing time to be in a tiny little spacecraft. The spacecraft would fit on this stage and flying through space, but then ultimately the job is to get up to the space station and get to work. That's why uh, NASA uh, takes care of getting our seats for us with the Russians and gets us up there to do the research. This is uh, right after we arrived on board. We popped inside, said hello to our new crew. Five days after I got there, there was a spacewalk to do. So I suited Sonny uh, Williams and Aki Hoside up, and they went outside to fix a little problem with an ammonia leak uh, outside on the space station. They did take care of the problem then. That problem has recurred a little bit since. And we just had another spacewalk about four or five days ago in which those guys went out and did a little bit more work out there. Um, they were only with us for about three weeks, just uh, a little bit irregular, but we didn't have too much hand over time with Sonny and Aki. Uh, there I am alone, looking out through the cupola windows and uh, taking, taking some opportunities when I was there on weekends to get some photography of the ground and getting familiar with the earth outside. It's really spectacular. When I flew on the shuttle, I had very little time for that. But when I flew on the, uh, on the space station for 144 days, I had a lot more time. This is actually the ground in this area right here. If you watch just shortly on the left side, that's Patuxent River, Maryland, uh, right there, that base. And I'm showing this because this is, if you look at the ground, this is how fast we're moving. We're doing five miles every single second in the space station, going around the Earth every 90 minutes. And I always thought it would really be neat to have a space station right down at ground level, flying by, and you could watch it fly by. Can you imagine 10 miles away, 5 miles away, over you, 5 miles away, and 10 miles away? I mean, it's just an incredible rate of speed. Uh, but because we're up out of the atmosphere, we don't have to worry about aerodynamics, and all is uh, safe. So we get in the windows when we can. When we go away, we close them up, make sure they don't get struck by any micrometeorites or anything. Uh, while we're up there, some interesting things happen. One of them is we had this really high beta period where the sun is out to the uh, perpendicular to our orbit plane. So as we fly around the Earth, we always are in the sunlight. It just stays over to the side and goes around in circles for days on end. And then slowly it comes back around and starts to be in your plane again and goes around you over your head and back under the Earth. And then you get nighttime again and daytime again. But in the high beta periods, it's always out to the side. So that's a really difficult thing for the thermal guys to deal with during that. Um, just before Christmas time, we got uh, a new crew. This is the, the crew of what we call 33S, the guys who just came home uh, last night, as a matter of fact. And this is some video I took of them docking on docking day just before Christmas. So a little, if you watch closely at the end, you'll see thrusters firing on the Soyuz as it comes, and it bumps into the proper place. You're allowed to bump into the space station, but only in the place that the engineers have decided it's okay to bump into it. And uh, it catches on to you. You can open some hatches and come on in. So uh, we had Christmas Day off, and we called the ground and sang some Christmas carols to them, had a little bit of fun and merriment. Usually it's very hard work up there, but some days in space uh, are just made to be, uh, made to be leisure, and uh, we had a lot of fun that day. Had some, uh, Santa came to see us, and uh, it was a day of playing, uh, just like hopefully you had on Earth. I had to cry uncle finally, say, no, no more. So Christmas Day, this is how we weigh ourselves. So, of course, after Christmas feast, uh, you have to get weighed. And uh, this works on an engineering principle where the frequency, uh, it, the, the frequency you have depends on your mass. So you can tell exactly what your mass is. We do a lot of science. We drop a lot of things. Things go flying away in space. Uh, this is me getting to a freezer that's uh, minus 95 degrees Celsius. So it keeps things frozen very cold. That's uh, some urine samples that I've uh, taken uh, earlier in the day, and I'm putting them away in the freezer, and they'll come home for science. They can tell by looking at that urine samples and blood samples how much bone we are losing and how much, gain we're, how much we're gaining back by the types of food we're eating. I showed you that slide of these two satellites, and that one in my right hand there is the one that has the goggles. 
and it's actually looking at the other one, and we turn them loose, and then these guys can fly relative to each other for 15 minutes, and the engineers on the ground can work on the algorithms they need to, to figure out how to maneuver these things to make them autonomous, how to program them up to go out and do a job. This is running uh, a little bit faster than real time, but you can see that uh, the blue guy there, the close one to us, is doing a little work on the other guy, doing a little inspection. And this, uh, this experiment is called Spheres. Very fun to do on board to set these up and watch them fly around. I might, this is something you might do for three hours on an afternoon. This is a picture of uh, some fish that we had on board while we were up there called Madaka. They have bones that are just like mammals, and we can look at how their bone is created and destroyed and look at the, uh, what they call the osteoclast and the osteoblast formation. And Japanese investigators think that there's a really good chance that they'll make a very big impact someday on osteoporosis. And what a legacy just that alone would be for the space station if uh, the world's population someday had some kind of uh, cure or prevention for osteoporosis. It would make such a big difference. Um, this is just a piece of equipment that Tom and I worked on for three days there. That's Tom Washburn and I. And we're just getting ready to put it back and, and reassemble it. It's a carbon dioxide scrubber, but it kind of shows you how massive things just float in space and, and uh, how interesting it is to work there. Some science is, uh, is more for spacecraft. This is something they're looking at how to control fluids and fuel tanks. If you think about your car at home, you never have to worry about where the gasoline is. You know it's on the bottom of the tank and right where the engineers designed the outlet. But in a rocket, that fuel could be anywhere it migrates to in zero gravity. So they're looking at how to control where the fluids go, where the bubbles go, and that's applicable to pumps on the ground also. And things like syringes, I'm sure some of you have seen maybe with a nurse or something when you're going to get a shot, there's bubbles in the end and they're, they're using gravity and flicking them to try to get the bubbles away from the end. And someday we'll understand how to do that by building the mechanism perfectly and not have to worry about flicking it or getting a bubble into you. Uh, one weekend I did a, a, some stuff for some kids uh, that had uh, Legos involved. And this is a Lego device here built, uh, built just to demonstrate some things that kids were interested in investigating. So we do a lot of projects for kids too. The kids actually can come up with some fantastic ideas for space exploration and we'll do some demonstrations for them and show, show how things work because it's really hard to get there and we're, we're happy to be the hands in orbit for any kinds of ideas that you might have. So there are programs to do that. This is actually just a blob of water I squeezed out of a water bag and I threw some orange Tic Tacs into and it just made a nice orange color there and I'm just spinning around playing, using a piece of dental floss to, to make that water uh, spin around. So a lot of fun. Hey, Derek. <laughs> this is our Dragon spacecraft, came up to see us. And uh, this is the birthing process actually. Uh, you can tell it's running fast, a little orbit, uh, an orbit and a half here. Ground actually did this birthing for us after we captured it with the arm. I'll talk about that more in just a second. And put it on the spacecraft. That freed us up so that we could actually do some work uh, inside while the ground controllers uh, did that birthing. So it's a, it's a development, uh, again, uh, over the last uh, six or seven years, they've perfected that, and now uh, it's just an advancement in space exploration that, uh, that frees up the crew. This is uh, time to say goodbye, and this, um, this movie is just about to come to an end here. This is what it looks like uh, on our screen as we're undocking and flying away, and then this is what a landing looks like. And it's on, the, it's on the plane in Kazakhstan. There's not supposed to be any trees or big rocks around or any lakes or anything like that. And we land out there. Um, that wasn't my landing you saw. This is my landing. We went into a bunch of clouds and we were never seen again until they finally stumbled onto us out there. It was really foggy and snowy on the ground. And it took them a while to get to us. So uh, they don't have any great video of us hitting the ground, unfortunately. But I'm, I'm here to testify that we did hit the ground. I remember it well. Uh, crawling out then with a little help uh, from the crew. After being in zero gravity, it's very difficult to really pull yourself out of that capsule. You, you just, even though you're strong, you still feel like you weigh a ton. And it's really, really hard to get, to get moving. They carry you away. It's all, it's all really fun and pleasant, to be honest. Um, I took a little bit of, uh, um, of a drug just to help me out. No side effects, just made me happy. And uh, they were able to, uh, to get me the helicopter and get me back to the NASA plane uh, so NASA could fly me home again. So uh, a lot of uh, Russians there, we, we are very familiar and friendly with these people by the time we end up coming back to Earth. 
And uh, they also take a helicopter, pick up our spacecraft. That's all that's left of that whole rocket that we launched at the beginning. Just that little capsule, that little gumdrop at the, at the, uh, at the end there. And this is uh, getting off the plane back in Houston after um, being really gone from Houston for about uh, almost like uh, six and a half or seven months total. Because the flight, the flight itself was about five and there's a lot of training at the, at the beginning in other locations. So that's, uh, that's some video coverage of the flight. Uh, I've got a few more slides. I want to talk to you about a couple more things uh, that are so the science on board that isn't in the video. And one of them is, uh, I understand they have the original Robonaut here in the Air and Space Museum, so I hope you get a chance to, to see that. Uh, Robonaut was uh, delivered up by a space shuttle, and we got this guy out of his, uh, out of his uh, bunk, if you will, pulled him out, set him up, and he operated maybe six or seven times during my expedition up there. And he can, he's learning to work switches and grab handles. He can pick up a 70-pound bar and hold it up over his head for an hour, and I can't do that. I don't think most of you could either, but that's what you can do with somebody that's robotic. And the reason it's nice that they're in human form is because so many of the things we interface are made to be interfaced with, um, with our hands and with our eyes above our hands and all that. So um, this last crew actually wore a device, a helmet, so that they could see what Robinot is seeing through his visor, and also um, they could move his hands. So it's, when you're wearing it, it's just like you can look out and see Robinot's hands in front of you, and you can move your hand like this and reach out and grab something. In fact, you can reach out toward yourself if you want to. It's really kind of a strange... Strange thing, but it's really fun to do. And next slides, if you'll show, I've got one here. There's, there's me just setting Robonaut up uh, in the visor. And if you would, the next two in a row, we'll show Robonaut flipping that switch and turning it off, if you saw that. He can just reach out there uh, with his binocular vision and turn that off. So um, it's going to be a fantastic capability for getting uh, lots of different kinds of chores done on board someday and even maybe outside the space station. So a great, a great development and a great um, kind of, if you will, technology test bed uh, for robotics. Next slide. Um, uh, in just a second, I'm going to run this. This is a little video as well. The sphere in the middle is fuel that's been introduced by those two little needles that um, come in from the top and the bottom. So they inject some fuel in there that can burn. And then the two little loops in the top left and bottom right are actually igniters. They don't have to touch the fuel to ignite it. They just glow red hot, and it'll light this ball of fuel. This is all done inside the space station in a shelf on a rack that we can't see at the time, but we do get in there and change these needles and work with these igniters. I changed the igniters out while I was there, and, um, that, and we just maintain it uh, as well. So what happens here in this video is as soon as it start, the lights go out so that you can see the fuel burning better. You'll see the igniters ignite the ball. The needles pull away, and then the ball burns in free space. And so burning in zero G is very different than burning in, in one G. If you light a candle on Earth, you can see it burning, and the air comes in from the bottom because of gravity and convection, but that can't happen in space. So it's very interesting for the scientists. Next slide. This is a, a, a column of water that looks like a jar of glass, but it's just really, it's water between two plates with some particles inside. And scientists are studying a phenomenon called Marangoni flow. If you'll go ahead and uh, start the little video there, you can tell it's water because of the way it's oscillating. This is real time again. If you were to go up and walk up to that and push it with your hand, you would just be able to knock that water right away. Or if you shook it enough, that water would fly away. But uh, we, we are very careful not to disturb it on board. It can only work, this thing can only work in zero gravity. You could never do this on the Earth. And they can study then the flow of these particles inside if they heat and cool the plates on both ends. So Marangoni, Marangoni flow, it's called in the experiment too. Next slide. And we're just about to questions. So those of you who have the questions, uh, go ahead and be thinking about them and be ready to ask me and we'll, we'll keep the show going this way. Um, one new phenomenon that we're seeing a lot more in space is called uh, noctilucent clouds, and they, they seem to be uh, more prominent than they used to be. And if you go through these slides, that's the typical atmosphere there. If you go through to the next slide, you'll see up high some clouds start to appear as we fly around the Earth. These clouds are about 80 kilometers high, so like 50 miles, well up out of the air, so way out in the atmosphere. And it's, uh, it's still very interesting uh, to Earth scientists and stuff, what causes them. And, uh, and what their impact might be on, on Earth. So very interesting. Next slide, please. You can see how, how thick they can become. And that's, that's uh, just below the altitude where we'd normally f fly the shuttle in the first couple of orbits. So it's, uh, it's really pretty, pretty uh, high altitude for clouds. Next slide. And next slide. 
One of the things we did while we were up there, this, uh, a new thing on Space Station is delivery of cargo and perhaps crew in uh, three, four, five years by commercial companies. This uh, spacecraft right here was built by SpaceX Corporation out in Hawthorne, California, and it's called the Dragon. And in early March, uh, one of these was launched by the company and flew up to us, flew up underneath the space station in a, in a place close enough so that we could take our robotic arm and reach out and put the, the end effector, what we call the end effector, it's the hand, if you will, above it and grab it and put it, pull it in and berth it to our space station and get all the cargo out of it. So a very exciting thing to see. It's a beautiful thing in space to see another spacecraft come up and approach you and, uh, and, and just watch the whole dance and watch all the spacecraft and, of course, see the Earth below you. Next slide. So that's what it looks like flying up. This is what it looks like uh, after, after the grapple out my window. And uh, we just, again, we, we were able with hand controllers to fly that big, long arm out there and grab a hold of it. Next slide. And uh, that's uh, after a happy job. We have it grappled. We can turn the arm off inside the space station. And then, as I mentioned, we handed it off to ground control. We went and did other work on the space station while they berthed it someplace where we could open hatches and get the, the cargo out. Next one, please. One little story here and a couple minutes over. Uh, this is uh, one, one day in space, just a human, a human factor story. When you're living up there, all kinds of strange things happen. This is a bottle, a bottle of shampoo that's just about empty. And you can see that the, the, the shampoo is not just in the bottom of the bottle, but it's on the sides of the bottle and in the top of the bottle. And uh, I, I hadn't used this Russian shampoo before on, on orbit. So I, I went over and I thought, well, you know what I'll do is I'll just, I've been using the American shampoo. Maybe I'd like a little change. I'll pop this bottle open and I'll, I'll see what this smells like, see if I want to use it. And I put it under my nose, popped the cap and gave a little squeeze. And uh, underneath that cap was hiding a nice big glob of shampoo and zero gravity. It wasn't all in the bottom like it would be on Earth. And I learned a lesson there about uh, making sure you shake that shampoo out of the cap before you, before you squeeze it in your nose. Good recommendation for when you go to space. Next slide. <laughs> um, also, one of the things that was really, really touched me while I was up there was a chance to talk to children. Uh, we used the ham radio and some other means, too, to do outreach to, to school kids and to adults and, and all kinds of venues, really. But uh, these, this is a chance for... Um, kids of all ages to get to talk directly to us on the space station. And we use the ham radio to do that. And, and here's, a, here's one day when I was uh, really enjoying doing that from Columbus. Next slide. Some photography, too. I thought I'd bring a little picture along of uh, Washington. You guys probably recommend uh, or recognize that if you've been walking the mall around here lately. So uh, that was taken uh, on the Sunday uh, before Inauguration Day. And next. And since it's so hard to tell cities apart from 250 miles away, I was just snapping whatever cities I could find. And I also happened to get Baltimore. So for those of you who are from the Baltimore area, you're going to recognize that one too. And that wasn't uh, too long before the Super Bowl, I think about a week before. So um, a, lot of, a lot of fun to shoot, uh, shoot Earth targets. Next. Uh, once in a while, ground will call us and say, hey, you're going to have an excellent pass over a volcano perhaps over uh, some maybe, maybe some icebergs have broken off, or maybe you have a storm. And this was Typhoon Bofa uh, back in November, and a great pass by Typhoon Bofa. Boy, when you look out the window and you get there with the camera, there's no question about uh, what's a typhoon and what's just a bunch of clouds. And I looked at that and I thought, there's no way I'd ever stay, a, you know, stay someplace where a typhoon or a hurricane is heading my way if I could help it, because it just really looks powerful and awesome uh, from the space perspective. Next slide. When you come home, you do come home, and the spacecraft, most of it burns up. You burn, but you don't burn up. Let's, let's put it that way. So there is a lot of heat associated with entry, and as you look out the window, it, it's, un, it's uncanny because you're just looking at a lot of fire out there and a lot of stuff around you. But this, uh, the engineering that has taken us to a place where we know how to safely get home in our spacecraft, and the very bottom... Uh, color, uh, the very bottom flame on that picture is uh, the crew. That was the crew of actually the before me, and I took this photo as they were coming home, and they're surviving inside that little fireball, the rest of their spacecraft breaking into pieces and, uh, and will, will burn up before getting to the surface. Next slide. And uh, back on the planet Earth. And that's why uh, I'm back here safely, and eight weeks ago, that's what I was doing, but now I'm here to answer questions. I, I love the flight. Uh, I love telling about the flight. Uh, obviously, space flight is my life, and uh, I'm just as passionate about it now as I was before I got into the business. And uh, I'd like to educate 
as many people as I can about uh, all the aspects of what we're doing out there and, uh, and bring, you, bring you all on board. I think uh, space is definitely in our future. It's, it's here to stay, and uh, you're going to see a lot of cool things happen in the next decade. So for anybody who's got questions, I think that's my cue to uh, start taking a few. And we got a mic over here. I know that uh, it's not as much fun when you have to walk over to the mic, I guess. <laughs> Any questions? Yep. So what are the common pathways to actually become an astronaut? Great question. Uh, we have astronauts who are medical doctors engineers, scientists, uh, pilots is pretty common. In my class, we had a submarine officer, an oceanographer, um, just all kinds of a, a geophysicist in my, my astronaut class. Um, really, any kind of science is, is qualifying uh, to be an astronaut. You have to have at least a bachelor's degree to apply. Of course, more advanced degrees, and the more you know about different subjects is, uh, is really great. They really like to see, um, of course, you know, you're not always doing science when you're strapping into a, a tiny spacecraft and, and you know, zipping up your, your uh, spacesuit and that sort of thing. A lot of it's really operationally intensive. And they, you know, they like to think that you're going to love the operations, too, because, of course, that's a, that's a big part of the job. So uh, qualifications of a really great science background plus some really broad operational experience is what they're looking for the most. And what yep. kind of uh, battery of, like, mental testing and group testing do you go through? It's not too extensive. You take, as you apply, you take some, some tests, uh, uh, just, just, just kind of things, maybe, maybe like an SAT or something like that. But uh, for the most part, let me just tell you, you know, the astronauts are, are accomplished people, but not necessarily, uh, they're not getting 800s on the SATs necessarily. It's just, uh, they're just looking for some, some good general knowledge and the ability to learn, I would say, is, is the big thing that they're looking for. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a good question. My name is Julianne, and I'm from and I'm from Maryland. Maryland. Mm -hmm. Um, what does it feel like to be in zero gravity? What does it feel like to be in zero gravity? That's a that's a fantastic question, and I, about the the best thing I can tell you is imagine when you go swimming, if you could float anywhere you wanted, close your eyes, not have to worry about breathing in water, and you could just breathe the air and you were in kind of warm water so that you didn't really feel cold or anything, then that's, that's what it feels like. Nothing touching you and just floating. Very light touch everywhere. So it's really, really a unique experience. What, uh, what makes it extra fun is that you can just turn upside down, though, or turn sideways anytime you want to and float in any orientation. You don't have to worry about the ceiling or the floor. And if you wanted to, you could just fly up to that corner of the room up there. Just give a little push and fly, but don't go too fast because when you get there, you have to stop. How do you, how do you, how do you stop? How do you stop? There better be something to grab hold of, and it shouldn't be a light or something like that because you might rip it off. You have to be really careful with the equipment and, uh, and make sure you have it kind of under control. We do practice flying faster and faster, and there are some handrails that you can always grab hold of, so you always kind of shoot for a handrail so that you know you can get yourself stopped. It's a great question. Thank you. My name is Brianna. I'm from Nashville. My question is, what majors do you have to do to become an astronaut? What majors? Mm -hmm. You can uh, major. It really just needs to be something where you can get some technical education. But we have teachers, people who are education majors, but have a lot of also science science in their education too, um, and medical doctors, engineers, scientists, physicists, chemists, any of those kinds of things. They, the, the mathematics is, is kind of important, so the more mathematics you can learn, the better off, and the, and the technical disciplines. You kind of really need to, to know those to understand a lot of the science and a lot of the operations we have to do. So those are, those are the best majors. And if, if you're interested, for people who are interested in knowing, because it looks like it's about time for you to apply, you, uh, you can look on the NASA website, and they'll tell you what the qualifying majors are. So that's, uh, that's a great question to know if you're interested in the career field before you, before you head off and pick a major. And what college did you go to? 
I went to Notre Dame. Uh, we have a lot of people that went to really all schools that, that can offer technical education. So a lot of academy graduates too that are astronauts and certainly uh, all the universities uh, across the nation are, are qualifying universities. Okay. Yeah, thank you. My name is Jaren, I'm from Nashville, and how do y'all mm -hmm. fall asleep on the, when you're in space? How do you fall asleep? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Because one of the worries astronauts have before they go up there is, am I gonna be able to get any sleep? And what's it gonna feel like? And uh, I was, I'm very lucky because I did sleep very well on space station. Um, some people have to change body positions and that sort of thing at night. Some people like a little support. That We have a small cabin. It's, a, it's maybe about the size of a big refrigerator or something we sleep in, but it's well lit and padded. It's got really good ventilation and lighting. And some people will put their feet on the wall with their back against the other wall, and that gives them a little bit of a feeling of being on Earth, so it helps them to sleep a little bit better. But we have sleeping bags, and they, you tie them to the wall so you don't have to worry about floating away. And they're very nice. You can just kind of lower yourself into them, zip yourself up, and then put your arms inside if you'd like to. And if you can sleep floating, then you can just easily fall asleep. It's not too hard. I would like put my feet up on a little handrail that I had put mounted on the floor. It was just a little rail across the floor and bend myself a little bit, put my arms inside and no problem falling asleep. It's a great question. Thank you. Hi, my name is LeMay and I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, how do you like work out at the space station? That, um, <laughs> thank you for asking that question. Work out like as an exercise, right? How do we work out? We have three excellent exercise machines on the space station now. Uh, one of them has been there for a long time as an exercise bicycle that the ground, the ground team can program with various loads. And you can get on it. You just wear uh, shoes with clips on them. You put your feet on the pedals. And you just can pedal for 45 minutes at various loads and really work up a nice sweat. Uh, you can always see your heart rate so you know you're getting a good aerobic workout. We also have a, a, a treadmill that we can run on. The treadmill itself uh, is, uh, requires special bungee cords and a special harness on the space station to hold you down against it. So otherwise, when you took a step and ran, it would just push you away from it. You wouldn't be able to keep your feet on the track. So you wear this special harness uh, developed by NASA, and uh, you can adjust it to different, different weights, and then you can run for hours on end with that, uh, with that bungee system on you. And then we have one more thing, that's kind of an aerobic exercise as well, but I really like that one. The other thing we have for um, anaerobic exercise to make sure our bones and muscles stay strong is called um, the A-RED. It's a resistive, advanced resistive exercise device. And we can't lift weights up there because everything's weightless, as you know. But we can, uh, with this machine, dial in a certain kind of um, resistance in the bar and there's a platform we stand on and we can pick up this bar we can lay on a bench and push this bar up like we're doing a bench press and shoulder presses over our heads and we can really work our legs out all the way up to 600 pounds of load if we want to and it's all based on a couple big tubes that are a vacuum and you're really pushing against the pressure of the air in the cabin with a lever arm that makes it all work out so that you can get a really good workout and we exercise two and a half hours every day uh, the whole time you're up there. And that's important to keep your bones in good shape and to keep your muscle, muscle tone. Fantastic question, thank you. Yes, my name is Rosalind Ellis Hyde. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm extremely interested in the psychological and artistic aspects of space travel. I write poetry about space travel. Mm -hmm. And I know that some of the astronauts in the Apollo program were very interested in this particular subject, Jim Irwin being one of them, and the other, I believe his name was Charles Duke, and mm -hmm. they did a number of psychological experiments, and I was wondering if this has ever factored into your flight plans. Well, we do, uh, we uh, as well, we look at a lot of different things uh, with the way our brain behaves. We take some tests regularly called WinScat to make sure our cognitive processing uh, to see how that's changing with time. A lot of the, the scientific um, individual human science we do uh, might be looking and interpreting uh, images and stuff on, on a display while we're free floating mm -hmm. and comparing the way we interpreted them on, on the ground to what we see in space. And then there are, there are some other things where we'll, they'll, they'll ask us to do some things, maybe 
maybe um, listen to uh, some tones or something like that, and then uh, make estimates on how we're feeling. So, you know, as a, as a pilot, I kind of don't understand that whole thing, but I do feel it. And I felt some things in space that surprised me. And um, just, just the kind of the way I felt about looking at the Earth, I, I found that after I'd been there for a few months, I, I had a different feeling about it that was, that was kind of emotional. And so some of those things are very interesting to me, and I wrote them down. And, and may, you know, may, uh, when, I, when the pace slows down a little bit, think a little bit more about those things. Please read the book mm -hmm. uh, called To Rule the Night by Jim Irwin. To Rule the Night? Yes, he mm -hmm. was Apollo 15. He was the, uh, um, I don't know, not the commander, but the second in command. Uh -huh. And he had some absolutely amazing experiences. And okay. it's called To Rule the Night, and I'm sure you can get it in the NASA library. Thank you. Fantastic. OK, thank you very much. This is a great question. Thank you so much, Colonel, for coming to speak with us today. <laughs> Happy to be here. I'm Lynn Fairley. I'm from Santa Barbara, California. Uh -huh. You said you weigh a ton when you get down on the ground. That was an interesting statement. The longer you're in space, do you feel heavier when you arrive back on Earth? How long does it take to recover a feeling of just normalcy in your human body here on Earth? What do you do to get that feeling? That's, um, that's a fantastic question. And uh, one of the things that I found the most confusing when I came back from my shuttle flight was how, how weak I felt, but how strong I was, on the other hand. Normally, normally we, when we pull on something, if you were to do a pull-up, for example, uh, on, on Earth, um, you, might, you might feel like it's very hard, but you might be strong enough to do more than, than you thought. Uh, there's a sensory perception as well as the real strength that you have. Uh, when I came back from space station, uh, because of this advanced resistive exercise device, this weightlifting machine we had, I was actually stronger, uh, about 20% stronger in my upper body than b before when I left. And if you had asked me when you, when you hung me from the bar and they said, see how many pull-ups you can do, I would have said, I can't even do one. But in truth, I could do even more than before I left. So that's a very interesting phenomenon, I think, that sensory perception. It's the same thing with, with picking things up. Um, because, because for 144 days in space, I never used any kind of hand pressure on anything. Even that really big device you saw us moving through the laboratory, even though it might be 300 pounds of mass, it, um, it just, you, you just touch it gently and you move everything so gently that in a, for a hundred and some days, a long time, you just don't put any kind of pressure on anything. And you've probably heard stories about astronauts dropping things when they come home because you'll pick up a cup and you, what you've done before is you just, you just feather touch it to keep it in position. But now with gravity, it's going to be pulled free from your hands, crashed to the floor. And we all learned that lesson. I did it again after this flight, even though I said I wasn't going to right on my kitchen floor. So uh, anyway, those, those things are um, really interesting and, uh, and unique, and there's a lot of study going on about um, getting past those. One of the things we do is we work with uh, rehabilitation guys directly. I mean, the day we get home, we start doing stuff, uh, you know, walking, standing on one leg for a while and, and hiking across the gym floor and back and that sort of thing, and they're, they're really building us back to normalcy. And it takes, it takes about six weeks before you're close to 100%, and about three weeks, two and a half weeks before you're not dangerous. Dangerous, that's <laughs> funny. And no more okay. snorting Russian shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> so it's a sensory perception. Mm -hmm. Yes. That you're weaker than you really are. Yes, yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. Second exactly. question, mm -hmm. I noticed in one of the last shots you had a really hilarious piece of astroturf that looked like grass <laughs> underneath your seats. Why did you put astroturf in Kazakhstan? <laughs> well, of course, we get pulled out of the capsule, and we're pretty much, all we're doing is looking at sky and, you know, breathing the fresh air. Uh, I guess they put it out there so that we people could stand there and not slip around. That's all I'm guessing. Uh, I did see it when I came out of the capsule, and, of course, it was snow-covered. Kazakhstan at that point. It was actually about that deep with a big crust on top. So they had a hard time carrying us around. And I guess they, they mashed an area down and put that grass down uh, just, just so they wouldn't slip around, perhaps. Very funny. Thanks again. Yeah. It's been okay. fascinating. Nice you noticed that. Thank you. Hi. My name is okay. Eric Front. I'm from uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina. Uh -huh. First of all, I had the honor of making uh, the clevis joints and the uh, radiators uh, for the space shuttle. Oh, man. And, yes. Congratulations. Uh, you know, it feels good for me. But um, 
Are you guys training? For you? They got the dragon. They're going to have a man thing. Are you yep. guys training already for that particular space? No, crap? not training, not training for it yet in a, in a manned role. Uh, I think the development, we have some astronauts in the office that are part of the development, and they actually can't even tell us stuff. Uh, one of the, pro you know, with the commercial thing, one of the things they have to be care careful about in development is this proprietary uh, rights and that sort of thing. But we do have astronauts that are out there and in tune with the people who are making the designs to make sure that, you know, our concerns are satisfied at the same time. When we finally have a mountain rated dragon, we don't want to say, you have to go back to the drawing board. We want to say, hey, we're happy with it uh, when it finally arrives at our doorstep. And of course, it, it will happen uh, sometime down the road. Uh, dragon is, uh, was a beautiful vehicle on board, and uh, right now, it, it, it needs a lot of enhancements, obviously, yeah. to fly people, including you know, emergency escape uh, provisions and uh, environmental control systems and that sort of thing. Yeah. So um, it's, got a, it's got a ways to go, but I think it's capable. The only reason why I asked that mm -hmm. question is, is because, to me, help building that uh, beautiful machine over there, they retired it too early uh, you know, because we went from 100% almost to 0%, and now we're dependent on somebody else. And yep. the space shuttle also lifted up the uh, space station to because um, it's falling. Yeah. What lifts it up now? Well, we can we can still use uh, propellant from the space station. We, we can take uh, propellant up on Progress and also the uh, the ATV, the automated transfer vehicle, the ESA vehicle, and uh, take propellant up. And uh, they can use the propellant from the back end of the space station, or they can use the vehicle while it's docked there itself to give it a little bit of extra boost. And that's done regularly, uh, more, more, more often than once a month almost, to go ahead and add a little bit of, of energy to the space station to keep its orbit up where it, where it needs to be. So that's what we do. And that's, of course, we did do that with, uh, with the space shuttle. So, and we did, we absolutely did hate to say goodbye to our space shuttle. So I, I agree with mm -hmm. you. I thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you for your service. All right, a few more. I'm Shania from Nashville, uh -huh. and I wanted to know what's a benefit for you to go to school longer than what's required. I'm, I'm sorry, one more time. I said I wanted to know what's a benefit for you to go to school longer than what's required. What's the benefit for me to go to, go sc to school longer? Go to school longer? Is that what you said, go yeah. to school longer? Well, um, you know, I've kind of been like a student my whole life. Uh, even, even when you're all done with school and you're done with university and, uh, and you're training for a flight, you're a student. And we even take exams and we take uh, um, all kinds of uh, a tests, sometimes before committees and that sort of thing. And of course, the ultimate test is can we, can we do the job on the space station? So school, you know, school is kind of learn, teaching you how to learn. I always looked at school uh, most as uh, well, maybe I won't use this material directly, but learning how to assimilate this material in case I do need it is kind of the most important thing. So um, a, lot of, a lot of school and learning to become a good student is really, is really good for any career field. I think you should always study and keep up with your career field regardless of what it is. And in my business, we, we, we even keep having exams right up until the launch pad. And if you, if you think about it, the, the launch itself is an exam of sorts. So... Just getting, it, just getting in tune with uh, staying with that education is an important thing. Thank you. Hi, my name is Aziza Kevel. I'm a, I was a flight surgeon in the United States Air Force. Ah, so <laughs> I'm very much interested in the space flight. Mm -hmm. I was uh, stationed at Beale where they had the SR-71. So we were always interested in the, what blood changes happen in your body when you're in space. What changes? For, yeah, like, uh, mm -hmm. do you lose a lot of calcium and vitamin D? You, um, how do you recover it? How do you recover? Well, uh, you're right. They have recognized that that's a problem up there. Certainly, uh, during the MIR program, uh, long duration flights, people were losing a lot of bone mass and also structure. And you can rebuild it back on the ground, but sometimes it's a very different structure on the ground when you rebuild it back. So we are really trying hard to maintain our bone our bone mass, and we take uh, vitamin D supplements every day on board uh, to, to help with that. And then the nutrition experts ha are can continue to refine what they what they feed us and what we eat. The, the changes in our body are, are kind of remarkable. Uh, one of the things um, that seems to be true for spaceflight is that you can eat as much as you want to, and you won't gain weight. 
I don't really know why, but your metabolism and the zero gravity is just confused enough that uh, there's some subtle changes to it. So uh, we, we, um, we see a lot of things up there are very interesting, and those, those flight docs, uh, they look at us once a week, they talk to us, and they look at everything we're doing, and uh, they've, they've found a way to, to keep us in shape, and now, nowadays keep our bones uh, where they're supposed to be, and our muscle tissues too. So one of the great benefits of the ISS, I think, for the future. So I'm getting, I'm getting the word here. It's time to uh, wrap it up, or do we have time for one more? Thank you. Okay, thank you. For thank you. Fa fantastic talking question. To you said wrap it up? All right, well, thanks again. Uh, what a great, uh, great room to be in. Uh, space shuttle main engine back here, models. I'm not going to leave here until I have a chance to look over the space station model. And uh, it's just been a, a fantastic experience uh, with all of you today. Great to be here. And uh, if you have any questions, maybe I can take a few even afterwards. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>